While its frozen banks and mud flats can at times evoke an almost eerie similarity to some of the images of the parched landscape of Afghanistan, the Petakodiak River actually flows not far from downtown Moncton, New Brunswick. It was here that the Pazira family settled, refugees from a never-ending war. For a young girl looking to start over again, her new home represented great opportunity in the face of even greater loss. My room was on the back, but that window, I actually used to use that as a study. I had put a table and, um, you know, just I used to sit there and write. And, and at nights, usually, I sat by this window and you could see beautiful lights all from, you know, different places like the houses across. Mm -hmm. And I used to sit there most of the nights and read and, and you know, open dictionary looking for words because I, <laughs> I did it. English classes and, you know, reading um, English literature, it was kind of really interesting. I just want to say hi. It's been years since Nellifer has been back to Moncton, but she cherishes the friends she made. Do you remember me? How does it feel to be back in your old school? <laughs> Very strange, quite honestly. I just kind of feel that I'm still the student here because I remember my seat and where I sat and sort of listened to the teacher. But Where did you sit? Um, I sat over there in that second you know, chair because this was the English class, which I loved. And, and I really adored the way the teacher was, especially we're doing um, you know, Hamlet. And I remember sitting in this class studying English and thinking about the use of language and, and thinking about how my ideal in life was, or it still is probably, that I wanted to fight, but I wanted to fight with words. I remember her as being a very elegant, confident young lady. And Judy LaVenture, Catherine Cox, and Nada Sparks were three oh, teachers who spent a lot of time with Nellifer so after she first that. arrived at Moncton High School on a cold winter morning in early 1991. She had a great seriousness about education that is not in, in I don't think, any of our backgrounds because we hadn't come from the same, the same kind of world where she had been. And, and I, I remember several times her wondering why, as North Americans, we weren't more appreciative of, of the kind of advantages that we had. And I felt that they just really lived in their own worlds. And it was very difficult to shake you know, anybody out of that and say, hold on a second, there is also someone else out there, there's also another world out there that might need your attention. And I kept thinking, you know, you, I have to do something, I have to talk to people, and I did to quite a large degree, I tried to. But it came to a point where I felt that maybe the only thing I could do is to try to make something out of my own life. To do that, Nellifer turned her sights to university. It was less than two years after she had begun to speak English. Brenda Winter is another of Nellifer's teachers. She remembers Nellifer being worried about getting into Ottawa's Carleton University. I did something which I had never done and haven't done since. I, I called up Carleton and said, do uh, consider her seriously. And she was accepted, um, I believe, on scholarship. In the fall of 1992, Nellifer moved to Ottawa where she graduated in journalism. Only a few years removed from a Pakistani refugee camp, her career as a journalist was well on its way. But the unfolding tragedy of her country continued to consume her. I remember sitting in that study room in my house, you know, and, and, and feeling like crying and remembering the faces of people that I knew and, and, and imagining the kind of tough times that they were going through. And, you know, I would hear about it from the letters and from the friends. In 1998, she received a letter that would set her off on a quest, a quest that would one day capture the imagination of a curious public seeking to understand what was happening in Afghanistan. It was a letter from her childhood best friend who had remained behind in Kabul. 
مادرم که برایم گفت برای I read it twice and I think it was by the third time I was sitting in my in my chair in front of my desk and by the third time when I was reaching a certain line I just start crying because you you get a gut feeling that there's something deeply wrong If I tell you honestly I only live in the past now future and today has no meaning for me anymore I only think about the past I feel as if I have lost something and I'm searching for it sort of from that moment onward I felt this was a goodbye letter Devastated by what she saw as her friend's dark hints of ending her life, Nellifer decided she couldn't sit idly by. Showing the determination and grit that has become her trademark, she chose the most direct path. What I wanted to do is to go to Kabul and, you know, find my friend. And that was, I had no plan. I did not know what to do after. I just wanted to go and find her. As in real life, the movie Kandahar documents Nellifer's journey as she crosses back into Afghanistan. Many of the scenes could have been lifted straight out of her own trip, beginning with her arrival at the Iranian-Afghan border. They were Afghan refugees. They have been leaving their own towns in Herat when the Taliban had taken over, and they had come and lived on this side of the border. Um, but they were very generous, and they said, we'll try to help you. And they said, as far as getting me to Kabul, they will try to help me and do that. But unlike in the movie, Nalifer's journey ended abruptly. When villagers returning from Taliban-controlled areas convinced her it was just too dangerous to keep going. They said their family members are being tortured in Herat by the Taliban at this very moment. It is not only dangerous to continue, but it's even dangerous to stay where we were. You know, I was disappointed, but I didn't feel that I didn't give up. I didn't feel that was it. Nellifer never did find her friend, at least not yet. But her story and the story of her friend's suffering has helped give the world a glimpse of the plight of the Afghan people under the yoke of the Taliban. And it's also helped fulfill a promise she made so many years ago to one of the teachers who helped her along her way as she set out to make a difference. That's a very important conversation to me. She held on to my arm and said, how can I ever thank you, Mrs. Winter, for all you've done? How can I thank you? And the only thing that occurred to me at the moment was pass it on. Whatever you have received, pass it on. If you are pleased with what you have, give it further. And she is. When I look at your schedule, You're so busy in so many different countries, so many different cities, talking to people endlessly almost. Does it ever get weary for you? Yeah, but you know what it was? For me, it was all those unsaid words that I think I had bottled up for many years while I was trying to learn the language, while I was trying to get to know the system, while I was trying to get the best of what I could. And this was an opportunity where I could just, you know, share it to let it out, so to speak. And I think because of that, there was an incredible sense of energy that just pushed me to do it. Certainly, we'll get in touch with you, of course. Driven by her passion for her homeland, in the end, Nellifer's story comes back to where it all began. Thank you. What is the most important thing? you want people to know about Afghanistan? I think it's not very difficult. It's very simple that the people there are just human beings like the rest of us. Um, they deserve to have a life. They deserve to have a glass of drinking water that they will not get sick with, that they deserve to wake up in the morning not fearing that they're going to be killed by the afternoon. and the, the, the cry for help and peace, that, that we should consider them as part of humanity. You know, we should just not ignore them and forget about them.